I seem to be recording. Hopefully. <laughs> Hopefully. Yeah. yeah. So, um, so the thing that um that brought me back to your content recently too is I looked up sex and love addiction because I was talking to a friend a couple of days ago and he goes to the uh, sex and love addiction anonymous meetings, love addict and anonymous meetings. And uh, when I looked up that on YouTube, yours was like in the top four videos that popped up about that topic. And um, you said something interesting in there about um, how you feel that, well, first of all, I think, I think uh, we should probably tell people what, like, what is self, sex, and love addiction? These are two separate issues, actually. Yeah. Sex, sex addiction is the compulsive need. Uh, just a second. Sex addiction is a compulsive need to have sex. Just let, let me put my back up. I forgot. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> it's okay. Don't you, don't you have compulsive. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. So, sex addiction is a compulsive need to have uh, sex. Uh, without any emotional attachment uh, or interaction with the sex partners when the sex partner is essentially objectified and used as a glorified uh, animated dildo or animated you know, <laughs> sex doll. Um, it is very similar to other types of addiction. We distinguish two, two big groups of addiction. One is called substance addictions and the other group is called process addictions addictions to process so the sex addict is addicted to the process of obtaining the sex not to the sex itself that's something that few people know he is addicted to the chase he is addicted to the conquest he is addicted addicted to the aftermath he is addicted to a variety of variables that accompany the sex and that's why a typical sex addict has very brief encounters, quickies in a way. He doesn't engage in real, you know, involved sex and so on. Sex addiction has nothing to do with love addiction. And conflating the two is very not useful. Love addiction is also a process addiction. But it is the attempt to regulate internal processes or to cater to psychological needs by believing oneself to be in love. Now I'll break this down. There are internal processes. For example, you have emotions. These emotions can be very strong, too strong for you. They can overwhelm you, a process called dysregulation. You have a sense of self-worth. Your sense of self-worth comprises your sense of self-esteem and self-confidence. You need to regulate this. You need to stabilize it. Some people cannot. Their sense of self, their self-esteem goes up and down like a yo-yo, you know, and they can't control it. You have cognitions, thoughts. Some people cannot control their thoughts. They have intrusive thoughts. Their thoughts intrude and they, they can't stop thinking specific thoughts. So as you see, anything internal can go haywire. Anything internal can go awry or get out of control. And there are some people who fall in love in order to regulate their internal environment. When they fall in love, they have a sense of inner peace, oceanic belonging and fitting in. They reduce their anxiety. It's a kind of anxiolytic, like anti-anxiety medicine. They medicate, self-medicate with love. Not with a partner, not with a partner. It's very important. They don't fall in love with other people. They fall in love with love, with love itself. They need to feel the process of falling in love because it regulates their internal environment and caters to some needs. For example, it raises their self-esteem. So many of them fall in love in order to regulate their self-esteem. This also applies to sex addiction. Many sex addicts 
engage in sex in, in order to regulate the sense of self-esteem. So in, in both these cases, it's not about anyone out there. The partner is totally irrelevant. In the first case of sex addiction, it is the process of obtaining sex that helps the sex addict to reduce his anxiety, to regulate his self-esteem, to feel good about himself, to avoid depression, etc., etc. And in the case of the love addict, it is a process of being in love that does the same things, caters to needs, caters to and regulates internal processes. The partner is fungible, interchangeable, anonymous, in effect. Even in love addiction, the partner is essentially a commodity, like grains of rice, you know. And this reminds us very much of narcissism, because the narcissist does exactly the same. The narcissist uses his intimate partner to cater to his emotional needs. The narcissist uses the intimate partner, for example, to obtain narcissistic supply, attention, and uses the attention to regulate his sense of self-worth. But the narcissist doesn't care who is the intimate partner. He just cares to have an intimate partner. It could be anyone and everyone. The partner is totally interchangeable. That's why when the narcissist discards the partner, walks out on the partner, breaks up with the partner, the next day he has another partner, if not the next hour. Mm. Because the partner doesn't matter. He's not there. It's a figment of fantasy in love addiction, in sex addiction, and in the addiction to narcissistic supply, addiction to attention known, known as narcissism. They're all addictive disorders in a way. And so it's very disorienting because when you're on the receiving end of love addiction, you feel as if you have never been loved before. Love addiction is an hugely intense. And so it's a laser focus and you feel that the, your lover, your intimate partner, the, the one who loves you, loves you like you have never been loved before and you will never be loved after. It's the most extreme and intense form of love. But, and so it's very disorienting to realize at the end of the relationship that it could have been anyone. You're not special. You've not been chosen. You just happen to be there. And this is what victims reject. Victims of love addiction, because love addiction victimizes, victimizes people. Same with sex addiction. Same with narcissism, which is attention addiction. Addictions victimize. Alcoholics victimize people all the time. Their nearest and dearest, their family members, you name it. Junkies victimize everyone. They steal money from their mothers. I mean, addictions victimize people. They're not victimless crimes. Because when you talk to addicts, they say, why do you care? I'm, you know, it's my body. I'm, I'm doing to my body whatever I want. You have no right to tell me what to do with my body. True. But you have no right to victimize other people, as you habitually do as an addict. So um, what is very difficult for victims in, in narcissistic abuse relationship, in love addiction, in sex addiction, it's very difficult then for them to accept that they are nobodies. Nobodies. Anyone could have been there in that bed. Anyone could have been there in that so-called love relationship. And anyone could have been the narcissist's intimate partner. They want to feel special. They want to feel chosen. They want to feel unique. They want to feel that there was sense and rhyme and reason in all that has happened. But there isn't. It's totally meaningless. It's accidental. So, of course, the partner of the narcissist, the partner in the love addiction and the partner in the sex addiction, they make their own choices and they are responsible for their choices. And they should learn how to not make these choices in the future. But as far as the narcissist or the sex addict or the love addict, the, the partner is irrelevant. And so we call this, pro, we call this auto-erotism. The, the love addict is invested in feeling love. The sex addict is invested in his in his own body, actually. He uses 
someone else's body to masturbate with. The narcissist is invested in his fantasy of grandiosity, of grandeur and so on. And so the partner is just there to uphold the fantasy, participate in it. But these people are inside their heads. They never exit their heads. As far as they're concerned, there's nobody out there. They're just using people. They're users. You know? Love addiction is extremely difficult to, to change or to cure. Uh, because it really, it's really a, a dopamine rush to be in love. It's, it's a, a pro probably the most profound addiction, the most difficult to disentangle. You can go cold turkey on many drugs. You can suffer a lot, but you'll be over them. You can, you know, but love, love is everything. Love has emotional dimension, cognitive dimension, social dimension, you know, love is intimacy, love is holding, love, love is such a total solution. You know, people say love cures all, which is another piece of nonsense. Because they believe that love is a total solution. And so being in love all the time is a dopamine rush. How would you give this up? Why would you give this up? It's very difficult to convince a love addict that he's an addict or she's an addict. And she should give it up. So I would never give up being in love. It's the most amazing feeling in the world. When I'm in love, the world is in color. When I'm not in love, the world is black and white. I want to live. I feel alive when I'm in love. I feel dead when I'm not in love. Why would I choose to not be in love? I want to be in love. So it's very difficult to cure this. But the love addict doesn't love. It's not love. It's, it's exploitation and usage. It's not love. Love is about accepting that the other party is separate from you and that together you can enrich each other's lives by allowing each other to develop independently and to grow independently. This is not love. This is annexation. This is invasion. <laughs> this is, this is the, the partner in the sex addiction or, or the love addiction is an object, absolute object. There's no love there. It, it's a drug, a drug to regulate your mood, your self-esteem, your you know, whatever. Yeah, I feel like that's a, a definite issue that I have that I didn't really realize until recently. Um, even when I was having sex with this one person, she said that I feel like she said, I feel like you're not here. I feel like I'm having sex with a robot. And that at first hit my ego. And, I, and I'm like, what do you mean? <laughs> you, you, you think I'm not? good enough or you know like i but then recently i realized i have massive intimacy issues like massive massive intimacy issues and i i'm essentially kind of doing or i am doing what you what you spoke of like i don't think consciously oh i'm just gonna use them but that is kind of what, what i'm doing but also i feel like i get into these relationships with people who are Either it's a codependent and they're feeding my, uh, they're being like uh, uh, the, the sex doll in a sense, or we're both each other's, you know, dildo sex doll thingy at the same time. Because my, uh, my last relationship, she used to, I, I don't know if this is just like a weird, crazy thing or if this is correlated, but she would have conversations with my penis. And then I, 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 I felt she was used, like kind of using my body in a sense, but then, then would, uh, you know she would talk to my penis have conversations like whisper to it and i would say what are you saying she's and she'd go it's just between me and him and i thought she was joking and she was dead serious and she would do it all the time so yeah this is called this, this, this phenomenon is called reduction it's reduction. when we reduce the partner into a single organ a single wow. part and of course you know fetishism Fetishism is when we interact sexually with a specific part of the body, for example, a foot, feet, foot fetishism, or a breast, or ass, or whatever. So fetishism is a form of reduction. And so when you, when you want to avoid intimacy with the totality of the partner, you isolate a part of the partner, an organ, uh, you know, and then you interact mostly with that organ. It's in extreme forms, it's fetishism. Otherwise, it's reductionism. And that's common in when both partners have trouble with intimacy. 
Now, intimacy, we, we, we are lied to, you know, going back to the beginning of our conversation when we spoke about self-help and everything. We are lied to about this too. We are lied to. We are being told, starting at a very early age, adolescence, the latest, we are being told that nothing is more wonderful than intimacy, that we should pursue intimacy, that intimacy is the total solution and the total cure, the panacea. If we will only be, if we will only find intimacy, we will find happiness. We will find gratification and tranquility for life. We will have, we will become better people. We will grow and develop and, and accomplish goals. Intimacy is the cure all. This is, of course, a distorted view of intimacy. Intimacy is hard work. Intimacy is hard work. And it's an extremely frightening proposition. It's very threatening. To be intimate, to be truly intimate, you need to expose yourself totally. You need to be 100,000 million percent vulnerable. Because if you're only 99% vulnerable, you're not intimate. You need to be totally vulnerable and exposed to attack. And here's the breaking news. In a majority of cases, you will be attacked. People will take advantage and abuse your vulnerability in an overwhelming majority of cases. So intimacy is a seriously terrifying proposition. Instead of telling us as children or adolescents, listen, intimacy is risky. In intimacy, you need to be 100% vulnerable. Intimacy is very hard work day in and day out, 24, 7, 60, you know, 60 minutes an, uh, an hour. You need to invest yourself in intimacy. You need to commit to intimacy. Otherwise, it won't work. And so on. Instead of telling us the bad news about intimacy, we are, we are sold the Disneyland fantasy variant of intimacy, which does not exist anywhere like ever. So people go and search for intimacy and they get disappointed and heartbroken time and again. And then they have two options. They can say, the hell with that. I'm not looking for inter 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 intimacy anymore. It sucks. Or they say, much more commonly, something is wrong with me. Something is wrong with me. Presumably, everyone else is having a grand time with intimacy, and only I can't do intimacy. So something is wrong with me. I need therapy. And the truth is, nothing is wrong with you. Intimacy rarely works. It is a convoluted mechanism. You need a user's manual of 1,000 pages long, in the best case. Mm. Intimacy extremely rarely works. And in a majority of cases, you will experience loss and heartbreak and hurt and pain, and you will be badly damaged and broken. And you will have to work extremely hard, and then you will be badly damaged and broken. So this is the truth about intimacy. So why should we why do I advocate intimacy? Why? Why do I think you should pursue it despite everything? Because it's good for you to be vulnerable. This is the path to self-love and self-acceptance self and self-awareness. Intimacy is the ultimate form of therapy. Ultimate. And it's you know relatively cheap compared to, <laughs> to therapy. It is through intimacy that you are forced to face yourself. You're pushed to the limits. You look at yourself in the mirror and you're naked in every possible way, physically, emotionally, mentally. You're naked. You're vulnerable. You open yourself up to true information about who you are, which is very often not favorable. You know, mm -hmm. it's, it's a great exercise at healing and becoming complete. Not perfect. No one is but becoming complete. There's no other pathway. Not therapy, not sex, not infatuation and limerence. Not, there is no other pathway. None except intimacy. It is through the agency of the intimate partner, the partner who is in you in this mess. It is through the agency of this partner 
that you become you. It's a process of becoming. And it's your only chance to become. If you never experience real intimacy, you are never you. That's not me, that's Eric from. You're never you. Do you want to be you? Now, some people say, I don't want to be me because I strongly suspect that I suck. <laughs> so I don't <laughs> want to be me. I want to be someone else. I want to be Donald Trump. I want to be rich. I, want, I don't know what I want to be. I want to be, you know, I want to be a billionaire. I want to be a playboy. I, want, I don't want to be me. And that's legitimate. That's another thing we should accept. That many, many people don't want to be themselves. They want to be someone else. They want to play a game. They want to live in fantasy. They want to pretend, fake it till you make it, lie, confabulate, what have you. We have to accept this. We can't fight all these battles all the time and win them all. We have to accept that there are such people and stay away if we can. But I think a majority, maybe not a big majority, but I think a majority of people do want to come face to face with themselves at some point. They do want to know, they do want to know who they are and they do want to become. Maslow, Abraham Maslow called it self-actualization. They want to actualize themselves. They want to see where would my potential take me? What else can I do? What can I be good at? And who am I? And there is no way to answer these questions for you, except if you're intimate with another person. Not therapy, forget it. Therapy is oversold. <laughs> it's overhyped. It's kind of like an echo chamber as well, isn't that therapy? Yes, in many ways. Not only echo chamber, but the therapist imposes her own values and, and beliefs, and there's, there's million schools, and if you don't conform to that school, you are shape-shifted. I mean, I'm not a fan of, of psychology and of therapy, strangely, because I'm a professor of psychology, but I'm not a fan of either. Therapy has its uses. We're not going to it right now. But intimacy far outweighs therapy when it comes to realizing who you are and becoming who you are and actualizing yourself far outweighs. And yes, of course, you have to pay a price. What the heck? Do you know anything that's free? There's no free lunch. Of course, you have to pay a price. And the price you pay is a potential to be hurt. Oh, you know what? Let me, think, let me amend this. The certainty that you will be hurt. The near certainty that you'll be hurt. You're a big boy. Go get hurt. Go experience loss. Loss is the engine and driver of growth and development and becoming. Loss. When you gain, when you win, Donald Trump loses and winners. Yes, when you gain, when you win, you're not yourself because you conform to societal expectations. You're a winner in the eyes of society, but you're an, a loser in your eyes. Loss is individual. Gain is social. So if you want to be an individual, you want to be you, you need to experience loss and pain and suffering and harm and damage. And you need to be broken so that we can set your bones properly. Because your bones right now are not set properly. You need to break yourself. You know, the military knows this. You go to boot camp. What do they do in boot camp? You think they train you to use rifles? I know, I've served three and a half years in the military. They don't train you on how to use rifles. This you learn in two weeks. They break you. They break you. They break you because they want to put you together the way they want, which is not something I support, but they are right about the process. You have to break yourself to put yourself correctly together. There's no shortcut. No shortcut. If you love yourself, you inflict on yourself pain and loss and harm. Self-love is about vulnerability to loss. That's self-love. It's a great definition of self-love. Not the bullshit that, that coaches are selling you, you know, online. That self-love is about being, being great again. You know, if you're just the giant within and all, all this nonsense. That's not self-love. Self-love is about saying, I am imperfect. 
I'm incomplete and very often I'm helpless and hopeless. And I can fix myself only through the agency of another person's presence and gaze. And to benefit from this gaze and presence, I need to be me. <laughs> Otherwise, what's the deal? What's the benefit of this? I need to be me, really. And to get proper input as to who I am and what I am. And this input is painful. Of course it's painful. Because you start the, the journey being imperfect. So the, the input from the, your partner would be, you are imperfect. And that hurts. That hurts. It's a narcissistic injury. But at the end of this road, you will be so at peace with yourself and so one with yourself that you will be the giant. This is to become a giant. A real giant doesn't have many cars and many beautiful blondes and many, you know, and access to coke, unlimited amounts of coke. That's not a real giant. A real giant is someone who is at, who is one with himself, at utter peace with who he is. Consequently, he needs no one. He chooses to have people in his life. He doesn't need them. There's a big difference. When you introduce people into your life, you can either need them, so you're an addict, you're dependent, you're, you're nobody if you need people. Or you can be in a position where you don't need people at all, not one, ever, nothing, no people. But you choose to have them in your life. When you choose to have them in your life, it's from a position of strength. How can you be strong? By being you. There's no other source of strength. Everything else can be taken away from you. When we study torture victims, I did time. I did time in prison, in one of the worst prisons in the world. Not, yeah. not, not a white collar thing. I was punished. I was punished by the Supreme Court judge, whom I humiliated, and he sent me to one of the worst prisons in the world. I went there and I spent almost a year in that prison. And so, what is the source of strength? What are you left with when you're in such a prison? They took away from me a business empire, $40 million. They took away my wife. Wow. She divorced me. I lost everything. Everything. I had holes in my shoes. Nothing. I was left with nothing. But I had me. That's what you're left with ultimately. You, your memories, your identity, who you are. Everything else you think you have, you don't have. Everything else you think you have, you don't have. The woman who loves you, you don't have. Your apartment, you don't have. Nothing, your reputation, nothing is bullshit. You have nothing. You have nothing. I have nothing. No one has anything except themselves. And if you don't have even that, then I, I pity you. All I have to, to do is pity you. If you don't have even that. Like I know you have nothing. Anyhow, you have nothing. I have nothing. But I have myself. If you don't have yourself even, then you're worse than me. Worse, worse off than me. You know? I pity you. Mm. So the con that, that whole thing about intimacy. See, that would explain um, why the uh, my leg fetish is a form of reductionism. Which oh if they don't have that then they're not the you know I it, it's if, damn that's my, <laughs> so that's a so that's a problem probably right that's not a good thing it's a problem because you are terrified of focusing on the person so oh. you're reducing the person to parts you know and you're terrified of of being you with that person so you are you with a leg with a leg you feel safe. <laughs> <laughs> I'm safe with the leg, you know. Oh. Regrettably, it's attached to other parts, you know. So you have, oh, to, yeah. you have to face the whole thing. You know? Okay, that and then the um, there was a term that I learned from the 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 SLAA, uh, emotion, emotional uh, 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 anorexia. Is that an actual? It's not an actual clinical term, but yeah, it's used. Yeah, but it's not wrong, right? Emotional anorexia, like the the idea of it. Yes, the idea is okay. There's no, okay. it's not a clinical thing, but yeah. Yeah, because that's something I I, I realize. Oh, that's something that I, I struggle with 
heavily as well, which is kind of ironic because I'm a, I do stand up comedy, which I feel safe on a stage. I'm so vulnerable, but I'm not really being vulnerable. You're not you being know? you. You're not being you. That's why you don't feel vulnerable. You when you when you do stand up comedy, I watch a few of you. When you do, I mean, all stand up comedians, not only all 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 uh, actors, all you know, public persona, public figures, in a way. That's why we say public figure. That's your figure in the public. That's that's what we call uh, persona. It's a mask, kind of. Mm. So whatever, if they pelt you with rotten tomatoes, they're not pelting you with rotten tomatoes. They're pelting him, the guy who tells the jokes. You know, you're one step removed. You one step removed all the time. Not only when you do stand-up comedy, from the little that you've told me, you one step removed in sex. You one step removed in stand-up comedy. You, you're kind of an observer. You kind of stand aside. You you don't take the risk. You don't take the plunge. You're you're all the time you're reserved. There's always something in reserve. Always always a, a refuge, a sanctuary, a place to run away to uh, inside your mind. You know, uh, and so you're never truly involved or truly committed to anything or anyone. You do things, and you may do things for decades. But that's not like being committed. I'm talking about emotions. Hmm. There is a, a cognitive commitment, a professional commitment, a sexual commitment, uh, but it's uh, superficial. It's superficial because it never involves who you are and your emotions. This, you, for some reason, which I don't know, you are not comfortable not to say terrified. You, you crave intimacy. I don't think you don't, I think you actually crave intimacy, but at the same time, you're afraid of it. It's like kryptonite, you know? It's your kryptonite. Intimacy is your kryptonite. And I think uh, the particular line of work you've chosen, which is stand up comedy, allows you to be you by not being you. It's like now I'm going to tell jokes. I'm going to be politically incorrect. I'm going to provoke you and tantalize you and taunt you. But if there are any adverse reactions or something, I'm, I'm pretty protected because it's not me doing this. It's I'm now playing the part of a stand-up comedian. I think that's the issue uh, with you and with many actors. You're playing the part. You're playing the part of a stand-up comedian. Now, that's a very important distinction. You can be a stand-up comedian and you can play the part of a stand-up comedian. It's like you're participating in a movie about you where you play the stand-up comedian. I don't know if I'm getting through. Oh, you no, yeah, it saying? makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> it's like your life is a movie and now in this movie, you're an actor and your role in the movie is a stand-up comedian. So... You do a stand-up comedian in the movie. This movie happens to be your life. Your life is a movie, like a movie. So you're a bit of a director, film director. You're a bit of an observer. You're an actor. But the whole thing is doesn't feel real. I think the sense of reality is missing in your life a lot. Many things don't feel real to you, I think. I, you go through, you go through them, but they don't Very feel true. real. Because you have this observer stance. You you keep your distance. You, it's a protective wall. It's like a firewall. You know? That's very accurate because I felt... I was talking to my friend and I told him, I feel kind of like a zombie walking through life now. Because the sure. high of the stand-up, I need bigger things, bigger stages to feel that. But now it's kind of just going through the motions. It's just, you know, I don't, I don't feel. And that's why... You're absolutely right. I I'm I'm, try, I'm trying to change that because I crave intimacy. I'm terrified of it, but I and I keep protecting myself by avoiding it, doing monk mode, celibacy moments, and then you know, and it's, it's like, oh, I'm going to learn something. I don't learn shit. <laughs> I'm just like I'm protecting myself, and that's the thing I just was able to admit two mm -hmm. days ago. I watch you, and you're funny. You make me laugh. Oh, thank but you. you will be you will be a hell of a lot better stand-up comedian the minute you become you mm. the minute you don't play the stand-up comedian the minute you are 
the stand-up comedian. The minute you fully engage your life, the minute you own your life, the minute you are in it, really in it, not observing it, not managing it, not directing it, not avoiding it, but in it. And this can be achieved only through intimacy. Mm. Not even therapy. Intimacy. You need to find someone with whom you would not be afraid to be hurt. I guarantee you hurt and loss. Guaranteed. Money back. But you need to find someone with whom you will not be afraid to experience loss and pain. And then expose yourself, become vulnerable, totally intimate, and experience the loss and heartbreak and pain. You need to go through this process. Otherwise, you will never live your life. You're not living your life. You're living a scripted life, kind of. You need to live your life. You have potential because I watch your, your work. To make someone laugh, you need to really access them. It's a sublime, it's a sublime uh, art, art form. In ancient Greece, um, stand-up comedians, in a way, they were the, the ultimate art form, you know, comedians. So you need to really touch people. So you know how to really touch people. Obviously, you made me laugh. But you could be a, a hell of a lot better just by becoming you. Just by becoming you. But you need to go through a, lo a lot of pain and hurt and harm and, and loss and everything with someone you can trust, someone you know who will not destroy you just for the for the heck of it, just for the fun of it. You know, someone you you say, okay, it may end badly, but if it does end badly, she will be my friend in these difficult moments. She will not, you know, jump all over me. Hmm. It's funny you say that because that's what I was thinking along those lines. I'm I'm trying to experience things more now. I wasn't letting myself experience anything except just the comedian, just comedy. And uh, I'm trying to be a more, I guess, well-rounded human being or just somebody that experiences experience, a human experience. Because yes. I felt like I was I I was living but not living the past few years. So I will give you the clinical term for this because we're about to wrap up. Mm -hmm. The clinical term for this is called constriction. When we are terrified of something, for example, intimacy or losing control somehow, or I don't know, addiction, or whatever, we tend to narrow life. We tend to begin to rule out certain things, certain activities, certain exposures, certain vulnerabilities. And so we narrow. Life becomes more and more and more narrow. And so we tend to, to become one track minded. We do only comedy. We do only business. We do only politics. You know, we do only, we do only sex. We do only love addictions you know so this is called constriction and it's very typical in your case there's a process of constriction you focus on the professional side and you're terrified to confront the private side um, again i don't know why i it's, uh, i i don't want i don't want to to be really intrusive as far as private this is going to be online so <laughs> i don't want to be too intrusive but the advice I gave you, I think, is valid. You need to experience a relationship with someone you trust. You need to be you in this relationship, totally vulnerable. You need to anticipate loss and pain because they will come. But when they do come, you need to trust that woman or that person that she would be there for you as a friend. Won't leverage this to hurt you even more, but would try to mitigate and ameliorate the, the hurt. And there are such people. I'm 62 years old, I can tell you. There are such hmm. It's not a myth. There are definitely such people. They hurt you and so on, but then they, they're there for you. And they carry you through somehow. Like, like in Vietnam, you know, in war. They carry you through <laughs> yeah. on, on their you know, shoulders somehow. They have your back. I wish you, I wish you well. It's been, uh, it's been good to talk to you. Uh, Professor Vagden, thank you very much for being on the podcast. I'm, I'm definitely you. taking your advice to heart. Thank you for your time. And guys, uh, the uh, I, I gave you permission you gave to me record permission? local files. Okay, yeah. so we are both we are both recording each other. Oh yeah, <laughs> sounds like consensually two, two FBI snitches. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> we're both uh, we're just both Benedict Arnold's. You know, we just yes, exactly, exactly. <laughs> let us let us jovially betray each other yeah oh yeah yes that's the best form of betrayal indeed indeed reciprocity, reciprocity is everything i agree
Yes, yes, very much. Um, yeah, well, you know, thank you again for you know giving me your time. I appreciate you being on. Thank the, you. Thank you for having me. The podcast. Thank you. Um, okay, so I'll do a little introduction, and then we'll just, I guess, we'll just get into it. And yeah. Um, Would you like okay, me to okay. introduce myself? Save you the uh, the heartache. <laughs> yeah, because I'm I'm worried that I'm going to introduce you in a very horrible way. <laughs> All right. I, I want I don't want to do you injustice. You know. Hmm. Well, my yeah. name is Sam Vaknin. I'm the author of Malignant Self-Love, Narcissism Revisited, and many other books. And I'm a professor of psychology in several universities. I suspect that's what we are talking. We supposedly will focus on psychological issues or socio-psychological issues, I assume. So I think by way of introduction, we can dispense with this and just get on with business. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, so... You, your videos years ago, probably seven or eight years ago, saved me from be, being in a horrible, horrible, extremely narcissistic friendship that none of us saw in the friend group. And we we always felt something was kind of off. And then I just decided to look into narcissism and your videos popped up and I did a deep dive into like a heavy, deep, deep dive of what well, was a covert narcissism and like the dangers of it and, you know, how to approach these things and um and 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 you made me aware of what was actually going on with this Thank friendship you. which yeah yeah so i'm glad and, glad, I could, glad i could be okay yeah and after that the friendship because you said the only real way to deal with somebody at that level of narcissism is to basically run away like you can't really do much about it Mm -hmm. right because no we tried no contact. yeah no contact yeah no 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 contact right and then and then after, <clears> after <throat> that happened uh because he would do like just the the weirdest things and and he would do a lot of things where uh he would hang out with each one of us separately which brought us into his world right but then the few times we would hang out in a group he would say his grandiose things and talk about like chinese history for no reason and weird strange stuff and uh and we'd look at each other and we'd be and we'd go like what are you, what do you hear what he's saying? But alone, we couldn't see it. Mm -hmm. We couldn't see it at all. And then once we ended a friendship, it was just we just became a lot happier. But uh, but yeah. And then and then the thing that stood out to me too was when you were talking about uh, that you yourself are a narcissist as well. Mm -hmm. And and that was like all I needed to hear. I was like, oh, okay, let's hear it. We have to let's really see what he has to say. <laughs> see what he has to say or not. No contact. No contact is a very difficult strategy to implement, especially in Anglo-Saxon countries and more specifically in the United States. Because in the United States, there's a series of mass delusions which permeate all the self-help industry and the therapeutic industry, therapeutic industry. So one of these delusions is every problem has a solution. There's another delusion. You never give up on people. People are redeemable, you know. Another solution is if you just want it badly enough, you can change yourself. And by changing yourself, you will have changed other people. These are all delusions. They are counterfactual. They're not true. Not every problem has a solution. Some people are irredeemable and incorrigible. There's nothing you can do about them anymore. You just need to give up on them. And of course, you may be able to change yourself. It doesn't have, happen too often, by the way, contra, contra to the hype. You may be able to change yourself, probably tangentially, you know, fringe in fringe ways. But even then, other people are not guaranteed to adapt to your change. They are much more likely to walk, walk out on you or break up with you or something. So there are these, these foundational myths, the mythology of the self-help industry, because people make a lot of money off the self-help industry. So it became excruciatingly fallacious and misleading. Very dangerous development in my view. Started in the 60s and 70s, and it's it's full force now with all this magical thinking of the law of attraction and the secret and awaken the giant within and all this, you know, BS. It's it's really bad out there. It's really bad out there. If you're looking for real help, you're extremely unlikely to find it. YouTube, for example, which is a platform where 63% of people go looking for help. YouTube is infested, utterly infested with self-styled experts who have no credentials, no experience, no knowledge about what they're talking. 
it's it's a, a terrifying state of things in in my to my mind yeah and even on tiktok uh that's where it got even worse i've noticed where everybody's a um like a master of of this self-help thing and um even psychology but all they all they all they are doing is regurgitating things they've heard and then the the audience who was watching says oh that's exactly how i feel oh you know everything but what's really happening is it's it it is just like an echo I mean, chamber echo chamber yeah exactly. yeah they're just everybody's just agreeing with each other to continue this propaganda yeah. of, of of the of just bullshit essentially yeah. Well, mind you, that's um, that's a social a social phenomenon that permeates or invades other fields of life. You have this in politics. You have this in in uh, debates about rights. Should you have this right or you shouldn't have this right? Is abortion a right? LGBT, transgender. You, I mean, polarization and echo chambers. That's that's a new discourse. There's no real exchange of information, opinions, and views. No real respect. For other people, for other people, and so on and so forth. So you you heard like you end up with like-minded people, and they they, they echo and reflect you, and you feel comfortable and cozy and you know warm and familiar. Yeah, everybody just it's not, only, it's not only in the <laughs> self help industry; it's everywhere. It's absolutely everywhere. So I'm curious a little bit more about your opinions on the self help industry because I've it's helped me to a certain degree right uh at least for whatever bottom pit that i was in years ago but you know because i kind of needed that um that kind of ignorance you know to move forward to just like hope and believe in something right but there is a point where it's like how much is it helping and and what's the truth so i'd like to hear a little bit more about your opinions on the the vast majority of self-help texts are ill-founded in the sense that they contradict findings in, in psychology. Psychology is very counterintuitive. It's not a science, it's an aspiration to science, but it's still very good at documented the human mind. And what we are finding out in psychology contradicts something like 90% of the self-help advice and self-help pseudo-information out there. However, the self-help industry provides you with a sense of belonging, a sense of community, a sense of shared misery, commiseration kind of, a sense that there is hope, a fantasy in effect. It's a fantasy world where there is hope because everything ultimately turns out for the better. Everything can be fixed if you only put your mind to it. It's magical thinking. It's very infantile. Children have this. Children believe that if they think about this something about something hard enough, it's going to happen. Or, or conversely, if they think bad thoughts, these bad thoughts are going to manifest somehow. So it's a very it's a very infantile thing. But you know, after abuse, in the in the aftermath or the wake of abuse and trauma, you are reduced to a childlike state. You are so hurt, so broken, so damaged that effectively you are a child. You you regress. Clinical term is regression. There is infantile regression following trauma and abuse. So you are a child, and maybe the self help industry caters to this phase in recovery, where you're so helpless and so hopeless and so infantile that you need parental figures to tell you that everything is going to be okay, pat you on the back, promise you, you know, the horizon, and and so on and so forth. The problem is that people that it's addictive. The, the problem with the self-help industry is addictive. You can't extricate yourself. Even when you have trans, trans, transversed, even when you have matured or graduated the infantile phase and you are ready to, ready to take on life with its challenges and everything, you, st you still remain addicted to the self-help industry. And the self-help industry perpetuates, for example, the victim stance. It keeps telling you that it wasn't your fault that you had contributed nothing to the predicament you found yourself in, that it's, this, it's all a morality play between good and evil, and you were the good side, and you are all good. It's, it's what we call a splitting defense. So the messaging of the self-help industry um, is that you are essentially a passive object, 
you have been the recipient of a force of nature of some kind, um, a natural disaster. The narcissist, for example, is demonized and compared to tornadoes and viruses, and I don't know what. It's, mm -hmm. it's as if you, have, you bear no responsibility whatsoever for the choices you've made, decisions you've taken, um, your emotions and cognitions. I mean, you, you, you're just a magnet, a, a passive thing. Now, this is an extremely bad mindset because at some point you need to grow up and you need to take responsibility for your actions and contributions in order to not repeat the cycle, in order to not enter re-enter the same trap again. And this is where the self-help industry, self industry fails you. Because for monetary reasons, for pecuniary reasons, for profit, <laughs> they want you to remain a victim for as long as possible. Because victims consume. They consume books, they consume self-help courses, they consume retreats and seminars and workshops. They, they're good consumers. So they want to freeze you in this state of mind. And if, if at all possible, to keep you this way till the day you die. So it's pernicious. I think the, the disadvantages far outweigh the benefits, in my view, overall, looking at it overall. Yes, they cater to your needs in the first six months after trauma and abuse. When you're really down on the floor and you, know, you need someone to lift you up, they cater to this need. They place you within communities of like-minded people, like-experienced people, and that's very helpful. But after that, they fixate you in a seriously bad state of mind, as a victim, as a child, as a, and they never let you go. They have their claws in you. And that's the end of it. They're like pushers. It's a drug industry. So drugs have benefits. I mean, if you've done drugs, you know, you know, they initially they are they're very uplifting and they're wonderful and you know, but you get addicted and then you end up homeless and worse. Yeah, that um I, I can relate to that because well not the homeless part, but <laughs> I can relate to that because uh uh when I wasn't doing anything with my life really, I consumed so much content of self-help, of just belief and anything's possible. And I'd read these books and just read other people's stories about how they were homeless and then became millionaires and just achieved everything. And I'm still sitting there just like, you know, with my dick in my hand, not doing anything, <laughs> like just going nowhere, right? And then it wasn't until I actually started doing, holding myself accountable and started doing things and taking action that I started consuming less and less of it. And then the magic of the these these help self-help things started to lose its power. As I started to kind of, I feel like that's when I started to enter the real world, in a sense, in my mind. Exactly. Right? It's a fantasy. As I said, it's a fantasy. They create a fantastic space for you where you are blameless and blemishless and flawless and perfect and angelic and the reification of good and your hapless victim. It was never your fault and never your contribution. And you made all the right choices and you couldn't have known. And, you know, this is what a mother would do to a two-year-old two or a six-month-old. I mean, she would co cosset him and, and protect him. And, a, a bad mother, by the way. A bad mother. A mother who denies her child access to reality is a bad, is seriously bad mother. So that's a, what a bad mother would do. To and beyond a certain point, it's counterproductive. It's debilitating. It, it, it uh, renders you dysfunctional and leery of reality wary of reality and you know because it's a catas catastrophizing narrative it's a narrative which says basically it can happen to you again any minute because you have done done nothing to deserve this there's nothing you can do in the future to avoid it you know it's it's a very catastrophizing and disabling narrative that's at the core of the self-help industry it didn't used to be the case by the way you know, the first ones who came out with self-help books were very, very serious uh, psychologists, such as Carl Rogers. So the first self-help authors were heavyweight psychologists, and all they tried to do was popularize the lessons they have learned in psychology. But then there was this, aval this avalanche of 
democratized, democratized discourse. Anyone and his dog can publish a book on Amazon Kindle, KDP, you know. Anyone can declare himself or herself an expert by virtue of having had a single abusive relationship. Anyone um, can falsify credentials or lie about credentials. There, there are no gatekeepers. There is a process of disintermediation in the sense that no one is protecting you from bad content, from wrong content. You know, in the 60s and 70s and 80s, we had editors, we had curators. When the internet started, we had moderators. Today, there's nobody there. <laughs> you are, you're on your own. This, there's a tsunami of nonsense, misinformation, disinformation, and malicious information. A tsunami. And you, you're on your own. No one is kind of... There were, at the beginning of the internet, there were curatorial projects. There was, for example, the Open Directory project and so on where editors used to choose prime content on the internet. It's nothing like it anymore. It's, you know, ranking is by popularity and, and their, their commercial interests that push bad content just because the, the authors of content pay. And, and that includes YouTube, by the way. YouTube has sponsorship agreements with specific, specific channel content creators and so on, regardless of the quality of the content. So it's really, really bad out there. Uh, if you are, so, and, and people lost trust in experts. They lost trust in scholars and experts and academics. So there's no one to go to. They don't trust the mainstream media. There's no one left. You, you look to your peers. You, you try to, you know, somehow fit into other people's experiences, but you fail to realize that other people's experiences have very little to do with you, actually, because you are so fundamentally different to other people. Every one of us is a unique creation. I, I sound like a, an evangelist, but, <laughs> but that's the truth. Every one of us psychologically is a unique creation, extremely so unique that it's, it's like we share 1% psychological DNA maybe. Wow. You, you can learn very little from other people's experience, which is my beef with psychology. Right? I think psychology will never be a science. We can learn very little from other people's experience. We, some warning signs maybe, you know, but even that is, you know, highly idiosyncratic, highly individual. Yeah. So you need experts. You need experts, but People lost trust in medical doctors, in psychiatrists, in psychologists, in physicists. And no one trusts anyone for anything. And there is this wave of egalitarianism. I have my facts, you have your facts. <laughs> and if, if you have a PhD in biology, it doesn't make any difference. Because my ideas about biology are equal to your ideas, despite your education. And so I, I've, I've been on a forum a few years ago, and there's a guy... A guy said, the Battle of Hastings was in 1066. It's a battle in the United Kingdom. It was in 1066. And the other guy said, no, it was in 1038. And the first guy said, well, here's a link to an encyclopedia article. And the second guy said, that's your opinion. My opinion that it was in 1038. End of story. Truthism. You know, there's my truth and your truth. And you see it, you see this poisonous phenomenon had penetrated politics where the spokesman for Donald Trump said this, my facts, <laughs> there's our facts and your facts. And facts are fungible. They are malleable. They are like, you know, can play with them. It's, so it, it's a, it's a shaky, it's, we, we are living in a, in a global earthquake. We are in a, constantly in, in, in the epicenter of an earthquake. An earthquake in terms of certainties. There are no certainties left, not even facts. No one agrees with anyone about anything because everyone is a godlike figure. Why is a godlike figure? Because he has a smartphone and he can surf those of those who know how to type. And that's a diminishing minority, mind you. Yeah. So, of course, the education system is largely to blame. Absolutely. What's left of it is largely to blame. We are regressing so dramatically to, you know, hundreds of years back. It's shocking to behold. And yes, of course, I'm an old codger. And every old generation says, you know, the new 
the young generations suck, we've been the best, etc., etc. Mm -hmm. And I'm no exception. But I'm also a trained observer. And I'm very, very committed to the truth, extremely committed to the truth. And what I see is mind-boggling. Mind-boggling. In many, many respects, there's been a regression of decades. Now it's being acknowledged. Now it's been acknowledged, but in many respects, intellectual, I mean, there, there's been a regression of decades, in some cases, hundreds of years. For example, the spread of the occult, esoteric, esoteric, esoteric thinking, conspiracy theories, magical thinking. This was typical in the 15th century or 14th century before, before the Renaissance and the Enlightenment. People were thinking this way you know, in the 13th and 14th century, when there was the Black Death, <laughs> magical thinking vanished um, after the 17th century. The occult, esoteric science, I mean, people were doing astrology and, and these kind of things latest in the 16th century. 16th century. Newton, yeah, Isaac Newton, was still an astrologer and an alchemist, but he was the last in the line. No serious scientist after that, no serious person after that did astrology for 300 years until the 1960s. So now astrology is again a big thing. Mm. And I find it absolutely shocking. I have no other <laughs> way to describe it. That anyone should contemplate astrology and energy and all this bullshit as serious, serious things is regressive in the extreme and, and threatening, absolutely threatening. Who's going to fix the bridges 50 years from now? Who's going to run the computers? Computers are going to be much wiser, much more intelligent than we are. Who's going to control them? People hardly, illiteracy has never been worse in the last 50 or 60 years. Illiteracy, functional illiteracy has never been worse. People don't know how to read. People have an att attention span of what? 10 seconds, 30 seconds, sound bites, and, you know, snippets. Who's going to who's gonna cure? Who's going to administer med med medication? Who's going to do all this? Who's going to fix things? I don't see anyone able to do anything. People don't know how to calculate without the aid of a calculator or a, or a computer. They don't know how to multiply, let alone logarithms, and this kind of, this advanced stuff. They don't know how to do it if they were left to their own devices. And, as, and they don't know how to tell the difference between bad information and good information. There is what we call discoverability issues. How to discover good content? What are the hallmarks of good content? There's no critical thinking left. People don't know how to think critically. There is what we call the base rate fallacy, where today people believe 90, that's 90% of what they are told, at the gate, without further verification, regardless of the source. It's, uh, I'm, I'm extremely happy that I'm 62 years old. I mean it, I'm not, I'm not <laughs> being facetious. Wow. I'm happy I'm about to say to depart. Mm. This place sucks, I don't wanna be here anymore. <laughs> No, but you're absolutely right about that. The the taking everything for face value immediately and just believing it as fact, it's insane. Because um, especially on like TikTok, TikTok has made so many like pseudo famous people, like celebrities, and people trust what they say based off of likability. If they like you, I think we someone froze us. Oh, someone froze? We are so uh, we are, we were frozen for a minute. That, that, there's a whole conspiracy theory here. Why we were frozen? <laughs> oh, uh oh, yeah. Okay, big we're, brother, we're big brother. <laughs> we, yeah, they froze us. They froze yeah. us. The they. Illuminati, probably, or something. Okay, that's we're right. Good to go. <laughs> yeah. Good By to the go. way, they is one person now. So just saying. <laughs> yeah, he, he, they. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. He, yeah. He, yeah. They. Um. It, yeah, you're right. You like there's... ability. No. Oh yeah. Popular yeah. popularity, like ability. Google started. I mean, by ranking content according to popularity, link backs and this kind of thing. Google started this revolution of replacing quality with likability and popularity, like an opinion poll. Information and knowledge cannot be subject to an opinion poll. 
you know, you want real information and, and real knowledge. It can't be, you can't judge it by popularity. You need to judge it by veracity, by truthfulness. So, anyhow, I'm sure you had other things you wish to discuss. So you got me on a <laughs> rant, on a rant here. Yeah. No, no, I loved it. I loved. <laughs> I felt the passion of it. And I, I agree. I agree with everything you're saying. And uh, it's kind of terrifying to think about that uh, future. But um, uh, I did have a question about the. You were talking about conspiracies, right? Cons conspiracy theorists and stuff. Is there a correlation between that and narcissism at all? Because I was talking to my friend yesterday, and uh, he brought that up, and I was wondering your thoughts on that. Yes, we have a recent study published two weeks ago, about two weeks ago, a relatively robust, rigorous study that links very strongly narcissism to conspiracism. And conspiracism is a psychological trait that predisposes you to believe in conspiracy theories. There is such a thing, believe it or not. So conspiracism is strongly linked to correlated with narcissism. So it seems that not, pe people who are narcissists are much more prone to believe in conspiracy theories. And one of the reasons is that narcissists have an external locus of control. I'll explain it in a minute. The narcissist blames you for everything that happens to him. His failures, his defeats, his miscalculations, his bad choices, his F-up decisions, it's all your fault because he's infallible, he's perfect, he's godlike. He doesn't make mistakes. You fouled it up. You're responsible for everything that's happening. But by doing this, by having alloplastic defenses, by tending to blame the outside for everything that's happening to him, the narcissist is actually handing over control because he says, everything bad that's happening to me is happening to me because of other people. So they control my life in a way. He has an external locus of control. And that, of course, is the essence of a conspiracy. A conspiracy theory is the belief that some cabal, some group of people, some unnamed force is controlling your life and is responsible for everything bad that's happening. You're not responsible. They are responsible. That's typical narcissistic defense. So yes, there's, there's a correlation. But there's also a correlation between conspiracism, the tendency to believe in conspiracy theories, and many other mental health disorders. For example, paranoid personality disorder. So the tendency to organize your life and to make sense of your life via conspiracy theories is a form of mental illness, actually. It is so powerfully correlated with multiple mental problems that it would seem to, to be a form of mental illness. And... Um, it is not an accident in my view that the sicker, the more pathologized our civilization becomes, the more we believe in conspiracy theories. Because everything is for everything around us is falling apart. We can trust nothing. Institutions have crumbled, anything from the family to the nation state. And so everything is so pathologized and so sick that it infects us. Our, our environment renders us mentally ill. So it's much easier for us to believe in conspiracies because mentally ill people believe in conspiracies. Yeah, that would make my friend very happy because uh, he he felt that and uh, that just confir and confirms and that's... Um, and, and, the, and the fact that an article just came out just recently about that is uh, very interesting. Um, Real quick, uh, I, I apologize. So it, it looks like that Zoom is saying that um, I have to Yeah, we have, we have eight minutes left, but what we can do, we can click on the same link uh -huh. and shoot another part, and then we can kind of, I can kind of combine the two, or you can combine the two. So oh, yeah, we could do that. That's true. That's true. Just yeah. click on the same link all the time. I mean, you can go oh, like oh, okay. 10 times 40 minutes. Yeah. Okay, perfect, perfect. Okay. Um, oh, we still have like okay, so yeah, sorry about that. All right, so um, I feel like can can a narcissist who it, who is like that can they are they forever a narcissist? 
can they change? Is it like inherently just a part of them when you're at that level of narcissism? That's what I get curious about. Depends. If you have narcissistic personality disorder, which is the most extreme form of narcissism, pathological narcissism, because there is healthy narcissism. Every human being has healthy narcissism. The self-esteem and self-confidence rely on narcissism that you had developed as a child. And this is called healthy narcissism. But there are pathological forms of narcissism. If your narcissism does mature, doesn't mature along with you, if it remains infantile and you're, you become an adult, then there is a discrepancy between your narcissism and, and you, and this is a pathology. So if you have a narcissistic style, in other words, if you're an a-hole, you can change and modify your behavior and everything. But if you have a disorder, it affects the entire personality and every field of your life, and it's incurable, essentially incurable. What we can do to some extent is modify the behaviors of the narcissist. We can kind of teach or condition the narcissist to become less antisocial, less psychopathic, less abrasive, less abusive. We can do that very successfully. But the core of the pathology of the sickness remains and is untouchable. So this is when it comes to the extreme form. And then within the extreme form of narcissistic personality disorder, you have two or three percent of these people who are psychopathic narcissists. They combine the best of both worlds. They are narcissists and at the same time they're psychopaths. In other words, they are going to cater to their narcissistic needs in a psychopathic way. They're going to be defined. They're going to be criminalized. They're going to be reckless. So these are psychopathic narcissists. And so psychopathic narcissists are, even behavior modification is impossible with these people. It's absolutely, they, you can't reach them. They're no longer with us. They are, they are, it's my way or the highway, take it or leave it, F you, in your face, you know, defiant, contumacious, authority hating, reckless, crazy making MFs. That's it, no way to get to it. You have, beneath that, you have the layer of people with narcissistic personality disorder whose behaviors can be modified. And beneath that, it's like a glacier, it's like an iceberg. Beneath that, you have the people with narcissistic style, about 10 to 15% of the population. And these are simply people who are, who are jerks, you know, and you, mm. you learn to live with them and they learn to live with you. They're adaptable. They're much more flexible. And they do change. They do. They can change. So, but unfortunately online, there's a huge confusion between, between all these. I mean, numerous disgruntled, discarded women point to their exes and say he's a narcissist, when actually we're talking about the neighbor. You know? Or they, they, they confuse psycho, psychopaths with narcissists. They attribute to narcissist behaviors which are actually exclusively psychopathic. For example, gaslighting. Gaslighting is totally psychopathic. Or lying. Narcissists rarely lie. Psychopaths lie. <laughs> so there's a huge wow. and humongous confusion online. I mean, there's a bloody mess and, and everyone lost their, their footing and swimming in the murky murky seas of the self-styled experts. But narcissism, narcissists are not good people. So what I'm trying to say. Narcissists have no empathy. They're exploitative. They have very strong fantasy defenses. In other words, they create a fantasy and then they lure you into the fantasy and then never let you go. They have a very bad impact on, on your own ability to discern reality and, and live in it, your reality testing, they, um, they make you distrust yourself. They very often bully you, etc. They're not nice people, but they're not psychopaths. Psychopaths are premeditated. Psychopaths use manipulative techniques like lying and gaslighting to obtain outcomes, to secure outcomes. Psychopaths are goal-oriented. They are seriously dangerous. They're antisocial. When pushed to the limit, they become aggressive, violent, reckless. So psychopaths are like narcissists on steroids, plus, plus violence and, and recklessness and defiance and reactance and so on. So it's like narcissist plus. And then you have borderlines, of course. And again, everyone confuses borderline with narcissists. Borderlines have psychopathic phases. 
what what, I, what is called psychopathic self state. They they become psychopaths if they are subjected to stress, humiliation, abandonment, and rejection. So it's very easy to confuse the borderline with a psychopath. Borderlines are also very grandiose. So it's easy to confuse a borderline with a narcissist because the narcissist is also grandiose. And borderlines, now we know, um, also have a deficient defi deficiency in empathy and resemble very much narcissists in certain cases. All in all, the new approach in Europe not in the United States because of money. Money corrupted completely the establishment in the United States. But Europe is, is not corrupted by money. So in Europe, we see, we see the new approach. It's unfortunate that it's new because I and many other voices, and much more prominent than me, have been advocating this for, for three decades. But all's well that ends well. In Europe, they eliminated all these counterfactual distinctions between narcissists and psychopaths and borderline, and they created a single personality disorder with emphasis. So you can start your life as a, as a borderline and then become a narcissist for a while and then act as a psychopath and then revert to borderline and then become a narcissist. And there is a dominant feature, so you would mostly be a borderline, but you can easily transition to other personality disorders because there's a single personality disorder, only one. And that's, that's reality. Reality is either you have a personality disorder or you don't. And if you have a personality disorder, there will be days that you'll be a narcissist and other days will you be a psychopath and other days will you be, will you be a borderline and a schizoid and then a paranoid. The personality is disrupted. Now, many of these conditions are actually post-traumatic conditions. Narcissists and borderlines they grew up in dysfunctional households. And so they were traumatized and abused as children. And they developed their personality disorder as an adaptation, as an attempt to avoid the abuse or the consequences of the abuse and the trauma. So it's a post-traumatic condition. I think we should take a break. And if you wish, click again on the link and we'll see each other. Oh, yeah, let's uh, let's, let's uh, do this again right now. So We should wait a few minutes for Zoom to record the session.